Uh huh. Okay. Um, five little monkeys jumping on the bed. Okay. Bed. One fell off and bumped his head. Okay. Yeah. Being out here on the playground makes me think about the kids when they were little and how much fun they had just running around, being happy. Things were simpler back then. I mean, I and Sarah, um, they were like best of friends like any other sisters. But even as little kids and the teenagers, they didn't show outsiders what was actually going on. They had a lot of secrets. Nobody could be happy with that stuff going on, not, you know, they just covered it up really good. Having 911, what's your emergency? We have a cab in our cab stand. It doesn't appear that there's a driver. Um, but there are two people inside the cab. It doesn't look like they're alive to me. I understand that. We've got our officers in route. My sister Patricia, I call her Tissy. We're 13 months apart, so pretty close in age. My dad was a carpenter, so we didn't grow up with a lot of money. We moved constantly, so we we had uh, new schools, new friends, and um, yeah, we shared a lot, clothes, uh, makeup, not a hairbrush, because she liked to complain so, but. Uh... <laughs> Look here. Go. Look. Smile. Yeah. <laughs> Again, give me smile. Patricia was 15 when she met Yesser, and um, I was 14. And they started dating. Yesser's from Egypt, and um, from what I understand, he was sent to America where all of his brothers were already here. <laughs> yes, sir's personality was pretty happy and carefree. I think he was only like five years younger than my mom. But my mom thought she was doing right and letting him get married. She was so worried that Tizzy was going to run off and, and get pregnant. Oh, you use your fingers. You don't use the bars. Yeah. 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 Tissy was excited and happy. I think she felt like it was somebody that would love her no matter what. <laughs> Islam is the oldest. He was special because he was the first grandbaby and the first nephew, and so he was pretty special. <laughs> Right away after having Islam, she got pregnant with Amina. And then Sarah was born a year later in March. <laughs> so a year apart, all three of them. She was always proud of her kids. Don't take a picture. <laughs> Yes, sir. used to always have that video camera everywhere he went. But even before the kids were born, he was like that. You know, he just videotaped everything. I mean, what did the teacher tell you again? I said, be nice to the teacher. Okay, what about Islam? 
I, I beat me did. to my teacher. Why? But Ted and I put her in the locker. They look like typical home movies. They were happy, they were joking, and the fact that he was documenting their entire lives, was, he was proud of them, he loved them. Hi, Bella. Hi. Don't you, um, do you want to see my snowman? See, Amina's is a girl and mine is a boy. They were very popular in their high school. Extremely intelligent, getting really good grades. It's like the all-American dream, you know? Hi, I'm Ian Sarah, me and brother. Um, I got a TV. Uh, I just want to show you all. It's real nice. And he likes me more than y'all, so... Oh, this is Abby. <laughs> no, but... When they were little, they were pretty close. As they started getting a little older, Islam was treated different than Amina and Sarah. Amina and Sarah could do something, and Islam wouldn't get in trouble for doing the exact same thing. Are you having fun? Yep. Where are we? The slams land. <laughs> yeah, right, okay. Islam was a big mama's boy. He had ADHD, so he was a little hyper and out there. He was the brother that liked to uh, just aggravate, annoy, yeah, just pick and pick. Welcome to my property, and I hope you, all you say is jealous. And okay, uh, you think I'm this a is now, so. you think this is your property now? I mean, I can buy a house here. No problem. No, I have two houses, one here and one there. Yeah, I think he was favored because he was a boy, but more so because he did whatever his dad wanted him to do. I think that was kind of the main thing. Hey, bye. Where are you going? I'm going to the bus. We have similar backgrounds. My parents are also from immigrants. Our parents are strict in general. Both Amina and Sarah had conflict of identity. And I think it's something that everyone goes through who have families who immigrated from outside. But then the more Sarah opened up with me, the more I realized that her father did not care at all about Islam, the religion, or about her culture. He never you know, even you know, taught them the basic things. Only thing he cared about was his authority. Look at me. Yasser didn't want the girls dating American boys, but Amina and Sarah wanted to be like the American kids and just live free. What do you do? I'm trying to add songs to my phone. Oh, I thought you studied or something. You didn't study? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm studying. Sarah, do you have lunch in here? <laughs> <laughs> I got a nice phone. You want to trade with my phone? Ah, your dinosaur phone? <laughs> it doesn't have even camera in it. <laughs> he would constantly be looking at their phones, taking their phones from them, looking at who they're messaging or calling. Okay, I'm going to the backyard, okay? Have fun. The thing I found really bizarre was that he would send their older brother, Islam, as kind of like a spy. He would come early to school sometimes. He would just sit in the parking lot watching us making sure that they were there. He wouldn't talk to me. He just looked at me in, in, a, in a grimacing face. And it was kind of another level that their dad would keep such tabs on them. Honestly, the first thing I ever think about when I think about Amina is that smile. The mom, Patricia, brought her two daughters, Amina and Sarah, into my class and said, hey, we're interested in martial arts and we'd like to give it a try. Sarah was sweet. She had a smile on her face. She was a little younger than Amina, so she kind of just sat on the sidelines and uh, let Amina run the show. And uh, run the show she did. Amina was like what Disney would portray as smart aleck teenage girl. Amina, how are you? I'm trying to get away. She was gorgeous, she was funny, 
but she had a major attitude and chip on her shoulder. Are you cold? We are, and I hate this music. Like he's crying. Mom, open the sunroof so Rain can get on Dad. <laughs> Joseph was already a student when Amita got enrolled in the school. Joseph was awesome. He was one of my other teenagers. They were both taking my class, and when she walked in the room, he would definitely light up. They just kind of hit it off right away. And then I realized that Joseph and Amina were an item. Can you please turn that off? <laughs> Amina had told me several times, hey, if my dad comes around, make sure you don't mention anything uh, about Joseph and her dating. I'm just like, okay, you know. Um, I don't really know what to say to that. Would you turn that off so I can talk to you? <laughs> you take a picture? <laughs> you didn't ask me, I'm not asking you. But that did seem a little odd to me. And that's when I, I started taking it a little more serious. Like, okay, something really bad could happen. I just didn't know what. Uh, what are you doing here? Spending your money? What else would oh, I do? No, that's bad news. She can't see us from inside, right? No. She looks serious. Because she's a fast checker. She's one of the top checkers. Wait. She smiled to the customer. Bella, she has to. Part of her job. She's in trouble. Mm -hmm. Always with that video camera. And there's nothing wrong with people uh, shooting video. It's, it's just creepy that you have it all the time. OK. You ready? She opened conversation, too. Mm. She is really in trouble. Here we go, guys. I'm kind of tired. We can spy on Sarah another day. He went to their school and watched them come in and out. They go up to their job and sit there and watch through the window, make sure no boys were talking to them. beginning, I didn't really take it too serious. Sarah was aware of the relationship with Joseph, and uh, the mom, Patricia, was also aware of the relationship. But if we were having any sort of events, uh, they would constantly remind me, if my dad shows up, if anybody shows up, do not mention my relationship with Joseph. Don't talk about us at all. At that point, I knew something was off when, when Patricia herself came to me, and it wasn't just some teenager saying, my dad's a little overly protective. Why? The girls never had either of their parents show up to watch any of their tournaments or tests or anything like that. So the only family member that would be there would be the brother. But uh, he never seemed that into it. In fact, it, it almost seemed that maybe he was there to kind of keep an eye on his sisters. Yeah, I, I thought it was odd that she wasn't allowed to have an American boyfriend since mom was American, but... Uh, she did talk about an arranged marriage, and I kind of thought she was just being an overly dramatic teenager, but she was serious about it. Uh, yeah, you're recording them now. Sarah really enjoyed Egypt. She was able to connect with her culture, her Egyptian culture. Like, growing up in America and even in her house, she didn't really get exposed much to her customs and the tradition. But Sarah did mention that she felt like her father may just get them married off in Egypt. She kind of joked about it, that maybe that's what my dad wants, is just for me to get married off in Egypt and just live over there. What are you smoking? Yeah. It seemed like her dad implemented the way he wanted them to live, not based on any culture or religious values, but it was kind of um, his values and what he wanted out of them. Hi, Amina. Hi, Amina. Hi. 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 Did you guys have fun? 
Yeah, and we're back on our way back home. Have fun. You miss Texas? No. I think he was becoming more and more controlling and threatening with them. And I think in part it was because I think Sarah and Amina were becoming more expressive themselves of what they wanted out of life. But they always had a fear that they might step beyond a boundary that you know, would you know, make him look bad and that they were becoming better than he was. He drove taxi cabs for a living. How long have you been working there? Two and a half weeks. That's only and you make your supervisor? Yep. Wow. She's smart like her mother. <laughs> oh, yeah? You know, they dimmed themselves in front of him as much as they could. OK, that's enough. And just you know, do whatever they could outside when he wasn't aware of it. But now they were willing to take more risks um, than they were before, really seeing how far they could push the lines. Wow, look at this ice. I'm gonna get sick now. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to do that, you look pretty. They definitely hid their boyfriends because that, that was definitely, I think, the last line they felt in their father's eyes. If their father found out, it would be, it would be catastrophic. One day, I was told that dad found out about the boyfriend and yanked her out of my karate school, yanked her out of her school. That was literally the last I, I saw or heard from them. I just knew that she was gone and we'd never see her again. Sarah sleep with her pants. That's for record, people see how you sleep with your clothes. Man! Nice legs. <laughs> I got this. Mm. Take this blanket from this one in the back. Get away! Yeah. No! <laughs> oh. oh, that's so creepy. Get out! Here's the other one. Get out! We just need to figure. Mmm, very nice. You know, the girls are teenagers, and it just seems a little strange. Uh, Get out! I'm erasing this tape. No, you can't. Yes, I will. Uh, are you drunk? This is illegal. Do I have to tape you when you're sleeping? Hey, get there. <laughs> I don't really like to look at it. When Yasser found out Amina was dating an American boy, he was really, really mad. Wanted her to break it off, and uh, they moved, moved away from where the boy was that she was seeing. Louisville, Texas is a very big suburb of Dallas, very diverse. I would say Louisville's like your small, big town, if that makes sense. When I had first met Amina, she was in the 12th grade. She was a senior. Sarah was a junior in 11th grade. And I was a sophomore in the 10th grade. I'm the type of person where I see details about people, the little things, you know, such as body language, their eyes, the way that they do things. I found it interesting how a senior would leave wherever they came from to go to another school and not know anybody. Like, what? who does that? Not many people just do that, you know? It seemed like they really couldn't go out like a typical teenager would. For example, if you're like, hey, uh, it's Friday night, you know, it's the weekends, let's go and watch a movie at so-and-so's movie theater. There's no way, <laughs> there's no way. They would go to Egypt during the summer and they would come back. And even though they did like being able to go back to Egypt, they didn't like the fact they had to it came off as if something was going on with that, the dad's side of the family. Don't know what exactly, but something was going on as to why they didn't like having to go back. Where is Amina? Inside. I remember I was working a shift at Kroger. It was an evening shift along with Amina. And 
I remember seeing a tall gentleman who had on a black leather jacket and his stomach was protruding. And he literally came up to Amina's lane. It seemed like she just froze. And I just remember feeling an odd, like an uncomfortable feeling. And I didn't realize until after the fact that it was her father. I felt something was going on, but I didn't press up on it to ask why. There was a reason why she did that. Maybe he was actually spying on them. Maybe he wanted to see what they were up to at work. Or maybe he felt he needed to insert himself as a way of saying, I see you, I'm watching you. Um, Sarah said that he basically was like a tyrant at home. And he didn't treat them like his own daughters. Like he basically treated them, what she said were like horrors living in his home. And then so Sarah and Amina, they both came up with a system of texting that any time, like, you know, I would have to text her, we'd have to, like, send a number, like, she'd send me a nine that, okay, it's safe to text. As soon as she sends me a seven, I have to stop texting to just make sure that he doesn't see any of her messages. That's the ironic thing of that, you know, I'm a Muslim. Really, the issue was that her dad didn't approve of non-Muslim boyfriends for them, then there was no reason for her to keep me a secret, but she was still scared to death in having him see me texting. I think that he really felt he was losing control. And I think that he was also jealous of the fact they were almost done with high school and see their potential and felt threatened by it. So, okay. and when you're ready to fire, when you're ready to put it in there, you load it and you push this back. But I don't want to do that because I'm not ready to fire. So. <laughs> I don't know how, you, actually, I do know how to pull it back. I've done it. No, before. no, don't do that. I won't, don't worry. I know you're scared. Oh, yeah. Mina's mind works fast. She thinks very fast, and she's two steps ahead of anything she's got going on. And looking back, it's like she kind of knew something was going to happen. The girls were doing great. Amina got a scholarship to Texas A&M, and she was going to be able to move away and live on campus, and she was so excited. After a little while, Amina, Sarah, they had boyfriends. They kept secret. Amina's boyfriend, Eddie, he lived like a block over. And then Sarah's boyfriend, Eric, lived, I believe, right across the street. I think they really believed that they were going to go to college, they were going to get away you know, from this man and start new lives. But Sarah told me that her dad had put a recording device in Amina's steering wheel. And after her father found the recording of Amina and what she was doing, he came yeah, into their room and he brought a gun, showed it was loaded in front of them as waving and, you know, telling Sarah that, um, you know, Amina's not going to be around anymore and you better get used to it. Sarah was just completely terrified out of her mind. And I was telling Sarah, like, you know, please, can we call the police? Can we call someone? Because we were really scared for them that this could escalate to a completely different level. But she kept telling me, no, 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 don't tell anyone, don't tell anyone. My sister uh, called me and told me that Yeser was making threats because Amina was dating an American boy. So they decided to go to Oklahoma. Probably one of the best moments in my life, seeing that message from Sarah that they left. I told Sarah, no matter what, just don't ever come back here. You'll finally be safe now. Don't come back. Just don't come back. Harvey, 911, what is your emergency? 
on January 1st, Amina called me, and she was really pissed off. She said, did you know my mom went back to my dad? And I'm like, no. I had no idea they were even in Texas. And she said, uh, asked me what she should do. I said, go get a restraining order and get as far away as you can. Just go. Having 911, what's your emergency? We have a cab in our cab stand. It doesn't appear that there's a driver, um, but there are two people inside the cab. It doesn't look like they're alive to me. I understand that. We've got our officers in route. When Irving police came upon the taxi cab, they found Amina and Sarah. When they opened the doors, they saw that Amina had been shot twice in the chest and that Sarah had been shot nine times. Irving 911, what is the emergency? What's going on, ma'am? I'm dying, that's what's up. Okay, let me transfer you. I'm gonna get the fire department online, okay? Hold on one sec, okay? <laughs> Oh my God! Fire department. Ma'am, are you still there? Ma'am, are you still there? All I've got is she's telling me she's dying. Are you still there, ma'am? Ma'am, what is your address? Ma'am. Once we knew that the main suspect was their father, that obviously brings it up a notch. Irving, Texas police got a call which pinpointed the location of Yasser Saeed's leased taxi cab in the parking lot of a hotel. Inside, the dead bodies of the two teenage girls shot multiple times and their father nowhere to be seen. Police tell us the father is the main suspect. They took me to the Irving Police Department. And I said, like, okay, just take me to my babies. Just let me go. They said, we can't. And I said, why can't you? I said, uh, they're okay, right? He said, no, ma'am, they're not okay. And it was so, like, It didn't, it didn't break my heart, it shattered my heart. And I should have been there and protected them. I really think that she went back because she thought that going back was easier than trying to hide and constantly be nervous uh, about who's following you. He would uh, abuse me, uh, kick me, hit me. He was physically and emotionally and verbal. I had ulcers because of all the stress. But the reason that I didn't do anything was because he always threatened my family. I thought that yes, it would hurt me, but I did not ever think that he would hurt the kids. After two sisters were found dead, the FBI is calling their murders a possible honor killing. Irving police believe the girls were shot by their father, who's still on the run. As soon as the news came out and I saw the main title was a father kills his daughters, an honor killing, and it's portrayed that in the Middle East or in Islam, it's a common practice. What really incensed me and made me angry, especially because I knew them per you know, personally, I knew what their house was like, I knew that you know, the father had not a single ounce of religion in their home. The whole essence of this goes down to nothing but a psychopathic man's desire to control his daughters and his wife. It was about 
the girls getting older and being able to move away and not having him control them anymore. And then once they, you know, moved out of the house, of which he knew it was coming. He just decided he didn't want to win the world anymore. So did you hear about her scholarship? You're kidding. Why, I am so heartbroken. I'm sorry, I'm sure that's good, because I can't believe that he took them away. Because he had a bright future ahead of them. Oh, the fact that I'm just hearing this, I'm just shocked because I knew they wanted to go to school. They wanted to better themselves. And I did not know that she got a scholarship. He just took that away from them. I'm sorry, excuse me. I'm just, how dare he? Those girls had potential to do great things, and for him to take that away, I did not know that. Excuse me, I'm sorry. I can't believe he did that. A candlelight vigil held for the Saeed sisters at 6 o'clock tonight at Louisville High School, where Sarah still attended. It is the first day back to class for these students after the Christmas break. Uh, it was organized on short notice. You don't want to believe it, even though you're going through all the phases of going to a funeral home and helping your sister make arrangements and picking out the coffins and stuff, and you're still you're in such a shock that uh, nothing is more reality until you see them laying in a casket. It's horrible. You don't want to see your baby in a casket. When people tell me it's going to be OK, it's never going to be OK. I just, I couldn't believe it. You know, I just cried on the phone for a long time. Even though, like, you know, we saw the signs were there that, you know, he could do this, but when he actually did do it, it took me a long time to really grasp how far, how low a human being has to go to kill his own flesh and blood. Yeah, just turn yourself in. You know, if you do, I'll get you a lawyer to help you out. Uh, maybe they won't put you on death row, but uh, you can sit in prison and think about what you've done. We will not quit until we find you. If it's the last thing I do, I promise I will find you. There's a lot of police there, too, because of what happened. You know, there's a memorial, but at the same time, there is a bit of fear that you know, what if he comes back? It was really uneasy. There wasn't really a closure to it. You know, he's still out there. The possibility exists he could really, he could be anywhere. He could have made it to the airport. He could still be in the state. Uh, but we're going to keep looking just like he's here and local. We're all heading out to go to the Muslim cemetery. And Isla was like, it's their fault. They are the reason why they died. They should have done that. They should have done this. Da, 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 da. He just went on a rampage of speaking down on them. And everybody's looking like, what is wrong with him? Why is he doing this? A private investigator told Fox News that he believes Yasser Saeed is hiding in plain sight as a taxi cab driver in New York City. Irving police say today that they have no evidence or reason to believe that Yasser Saeed is in New York City. You pray every day, you know, please let this be the day he gets caught. And then, so it's just really hard because each day goes by and it's like, God's not hearing you. Why did I come back? How come I didn't make the right decision? Why did I let him go away with him? Just different things just kept going around and around and around. 
a lot of people don't realize that she didn't just lose her girls. She lost everything in one day. And they like to say she shouldn't have went back, you know, and what these people are failing to understand that it's easier to blame the person that's not there than to blame the person that actually did it. It's been almost seven years now since the brutal murders of two teenage girls in Irving, and today their father is the newest addition to the FBI's 10 most wanted list. It all started with a maintenance man walking up to an apartment door, knocking on the door because he wanted to fix a pipe. The maintenance worker very astutely looks him over and thinks to himself, I've seen this person before. He was able to connect that face with that poster. He alerts his manager. The manager calls FBI. FBI special agent shows up at the door at 6.15. Islam opens the door. And Islam refuses to let him in. Islam's like, there's no way in hell you're coming in here. Go get a warrant. OK, that's a tip. It's time to go. But they found what turned out to be a mountain of evidence. They found a used cigarette butt. They found a hairbrush. They found a toothbrush. What are you going to get off that DNA? So it let police and it let the FBI know this guy is still in Texas. And that means they could set up surveillance. Their belief is if we watch Islam, he will eventually lead us to his father. So finally, after about 10 or 12 days worth of surveillance, they believe they have enough. All new at 10 o'clock, 12 years after his daughters were murdered and after more than five years on the FBI's most uh, top 10 most wanted list. Tonight, Yasser Saeed is in police custody, we can report. Irving PD and the FBI tell us they worked together to track down and find him. They arrested him in the city of Justin in Denton County today. Saeed is now charged with capital murder. I cried. It was a big moment of relief uh, for me after so many years. I mean, I'd pray every day, every morning, I'd pray that, you know, somehow through a miracle, just God find him and bring him to justice and bring their souls peace. Harvey, 911, what is your emergency? Oh, oh my God, It was one of the things about Sarah that she was the fighter. It was a, definitely a miracle that you know she was able to do that in her last breaths uh, to make sure that there's not a shadow of a doubt that he was the one who did this. The attorney's office charged two family members, Yasser's son, Islam, and brother Yassin, accusing them of protecting the fugitive from arrest. The police believe the two had been protecting Saeed since at least 2017. I was still mad at Islam. I love Islam for the boy that I knew. I don't like Islam for the man he's become. It was like a like a wound had opened up and somebody poured alcohol in it. I couldn't believe it. I can't stop loving my son, but I do not like him right now. So yes, sir, uh, keeps claiming he's innocent. He didn't do it. Um, but he'll have his day in court just like anyone else. I have to face him. I have to tell him what he, what he did. I want him to know what he has done and how many people he has hurt.
I made sure anytime I was home on leave, I make sure I go and see them and I lay flowers. I try to change the colors each time so that they know they're not forgotten. And um, somebody cares about them. They loved each other so much. My heart an open wound. I can only cry. I don't try to understand. Make me a bird, let me fly. I hate you. I hate your land. You froze in my heart, let me die. I felt like uh, that Amina knew something was gonna happen. I don't know if she thought she was gonna die, but I think that she knew there was big changes coming. Make me an angel, let me fly round and around. Let me go and can I be found? My pain, you will never know. You don't know me, and here I don't want to be. It's been, you know, over 13 years now. I talk about Amina and Sarah a lot. I talk to my daughter all the time about, about it. My grandbaby's named after Amina. I mean it. <laughs> They're not just a memory, not to us anyway. <laughs>